And so, you know, you have spoken a lot about physicians and the mental health of physicians in the practice. And you have said, you have cited a figure that says that, uh, you know, 50% of doctors report um, significant amount of burnout in their profession, which means that they're not happy with their profession, with their jobs. And, like, one of the things that you have said is that perhaps it's because of the fact that many physicians don't feel that connection with their patients or that perhaps they don't have the time or the agency to process the, the things that they see, that they are in need of telling or developing their own story about their work in a place of illness and suffering. Is that, is that how you see the, that issue of burnout? Um, well, so I, I think of burnout, and I, I, think, so I think burnout is a placeholder for something that is important and relevant to the discussion of presence and suffering. And, and here's why. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what exactly burnout is. Um, I think it's a, it's a word that, um, that needs, it's not self-evident. It needs to be populated. And it, it needs to be populated carefully. Because whatever it's pointing to is a complicated problem. It's a problem that a lot of times in theology, medicine, and culture, when we're talking about some of the difficult problems that that, that, um, that, that group Addresses we call it a wicked problem. You know, we just borrow it, steal it from the business community. It's a wicked problem, one that's so hard that you have to begin to try to solve it and fail, and then figure out why you failed in order to even understand the problem well enough to come up with a second iteration of, okay, well, now we understand it better. Now we can come up with a better response. It's that deep of a problem. Um, I think that there have been some changes in medicine that have um, moved us toward a concept of efficiency that is much more fitting um, if the model of the body as a machine, end of story, full stop, were true. If the body is a machine, full stop, then I think that the kind of efficiencies that corporations try to build into systems make a lot of sense. But if at the Ford factory, for example, all of a sudden, all the cars in the factory line became sentient and capable of suffering, so that every time the, the, the machine went it screamed. There would be a lot of concern in the Ford factory <laughs> that certain unexpected needs on the part of these sentient cars were not currently being met. It would be newsworthy, and there would be protests that evolve, and things would need to change. And so I think that when we talk about burnout, what we're talking about is um, why, why are these people that we have asked to, we've given them a intimate access to our stories, to our bodies, to things that might shame us, you know, to our blemishes, to our, 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 our inability to function in important ways. It may be an inability to see, oh, well now I can't drive. You know, it may, be, it may be impotence, something that's deeply related, you know, to our identity. Um, it may be, you know, breast cancer and, and losing something important about my body that, 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 that changes fundamentally my identity, but I can't talk about it. I'm not going to go to church and say, yeah, you know, my breast is going to get cut off and this really bothers me because my breasts are important to me. How do you, where do you talk about that? 
But you know what? It's true. Um, Augustine knew it was true. Augustine pointed to small things to point out how important they were. I mean, he basically, he said in the middle of the city of God, you know, it's a book, it's like that. Um, He's got this little place where he says, um, you don't think small things matter? I'll tell you what, shave off one eyebrow. (laughs) And then walk around and see how your day goes. See if you think about anything other than the absence of your eyebrow, right? It's just a little bit, there's nothing. It's a little bit of hair. It's a wisp. Nothing. Nothing. So burnout is if we're placed in positions where there are these delicate but vital forms of fragility, vulnerability, pleas from people, to be seen and not shamed, to be seen in reality so that they can take their mask off and do it trusting that you are worthy of this trust, right? So if we put people in a place where that's the gift that, this, that, that, that me as a patient, that I'm giving to you as my doctor, um, but you're placed in a position to function with maximal efficiency that's more appropriate to a machine, then you're placed in a genuine crisis. If you're trained to do nothing but take care of the machine, but my thing I'm doing is showing you, Dr. Jeff, like, here's my, here's my fragility, right? And you're like, whoa, we don't do fragility around here. Really? You don't do fragility around here? Guess what, bud? You are the only one who has like legal permission to bear witness to certain kinds of fragility, right? So you better know something about what to do with it. And so we begin to feel this like disconnect between the role that we're asked by patients to play. The role that patients want us to play is very often, I think, the role that we envisioned for ourselves. And then we find ourselves 10 years down the training in an institution that has a completely different set of priorities that fit a completely different model of the world, a machine mechanical kind of view of the world and of the body. And the skills that we've been given are the skills um, that were decided on by a series of schools that have bought into that kind of model. And then there we are, we close the door and all of a sudden this person is asking for something that we are utterly unprepared for. And so I I think that there are things like that. I I wouldn't reduce the problem of burnout or moral injury or whatever you want to call it to just that. That to me is the flavor of the crisis. And the reason I say it's so relevant to this issue of suffering and presence is that I think it's these kinds of things that break my radar so that I can't pick up the signals in the room. It may be that, and and I learned this from social workers, nurses, and chaplains, whose radars are working, and, and who apparently have felt or sensed or seen or heard something in the room that I just missed. And when they get to know me, um, they know that I invite critique and that I want to know if I have missed something. Um, and they, many, many of them have taken, <laughs> taken me up on that offer. Um, and so I've been on the receiving end of quite a bit of criticism, but it's been so helpful, painful, but helpful. Um, and it's, it did, 10 years ago, lead me to a different kind of question. How can I repair my radar? How can I acquire skills that I don't yet have so that I can respond when I pick something up. Um, I believe that if we addressed more of those kinds of things, that we would be at least on our way to addressing this issue of, of burnout. But I think we would also be on our way to addressing the kinds of questions this conference is, is asking. So how do you walk into a room where there's great suffering and establish presence How do you find the courage to remain when you have no words to say? No idea how to fix a thing? 
And where your first inclination until you gain a, until you gain a maturity in this is, is to leave because it's uncomfortable. Um, I think that, that, that both of those things will be answered like side by side. 